Today, I believe, at the end of this message, we're going to sing again. And we're going to sing a song of incredible victory. I believe with all my heart that people who have, are here today and you've been struggling with something in your life, and it's threatened to hold you captive, Today, your prison door is going to open. You're going to be set free. <laughs> and then for those who Satan is trying to lock you in a prison of fear, fear about today, fear about tomorrow, fear about your future, you're going to walk out of that place. For those who are not in it yet, you're not going to go in it at all. <laughs> the Lord is going to instill, if you will open your heart to this, and that's, we're going to go through a lot of scripture, but if you'll just, it's a very simple word, but if you'll open your heart to it, I know in my heart that God has given me this. I'm standing here speaking something from the heart of God for you today. Pray that the Lord give you the grace to receive it. Proverbs chapter 3, please, if you'll turn there. The message is called, The Power to Do Good is, is in Your Hand. The Power to Do Good is in Your Hand. Now, Father, I thank you, Lord, with all my heart that I've never had to stand here in my own strength. God, I'm so deeply grateful for that. I thank you, Lord, that today you will come upon me, Holy Spirit. You'll overshadow my frailty, and you will allow me to speak from heaven. I ask you, God, to take this word and quicken it, enliven it, Lord. Let it find root in every heart of every person who's gathered to hear it today. I pray, God, that our hearts burn like the men on the road to Emmaus. Jesus, when you spoke to them and unlocked the scriptures, there was such faith came into them. Such a change, Lord, such a lifting out of despondency and a translating into faith. God, do that today, Lord. And all we can do, Lord, is appeal to you. But Lord, you told us to come and ask for grace to help in our time of need. I thank you, Lord that you're going to do something supernatural and sovereign in this house today. I praise you, God, for it with all my heart. I back away from it, Lord. All I can do is deliver your word. The rest is up to you. Lord, thank you that you will give people faith and you will meet those who choose to meet with you. I thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Proverbs chapter 3, beginning at verse 19. The power to do good is in your hand. The Lord by wisdom has founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. By his knowledge the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down the dew. My son, let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. Then shalt thou walk in the w thy way safely and thy foot shall not stumble. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. For the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. Say not to thy neighbor, Go, and come again, and tomorrow I will give thee when thou hast it by thee. Now this particular passage in the Psalms <clears throat> begins in verse 19 with something that we should understand, that should, should be, now, this is the Holy Spirit putting this wisdom in the heart of Solomon as he writes this. And he says, the Lord by wisdom has founded the earth and by understanding established the heavens. In other words, there's a knowledge in God and God's ways are so much higher than our ways. And his thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts. God had the thought come into his heart and he established, he founded the earth and he established the heavens. He put everything in its place. It moves like an incredible clockwork, the likes of which there's nothing on the earth to compare it to. It's an amazing thing when you, geez, even a cursory study of the various solar systems and the universe in general and how everything functions can't leave you standing in anything but an awe of the incredible knowledge of God, the incredible power of God, the incredible wisdom of God, how he has created all things 
And by his knowledge, he says in verse 20, the depths are broken up. That's the present tense. Past tense, he has founded the earth. Present tense, by his knowledge, the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down the dew. In other words, everything that is happening today has been preordained by God to do everything that it is doing. Nothing is happening that's out of God's control. Irrespective of whether there's rain in one place and a lack of rain in another, the Lord's hand is in everything. He has not lost control of this world. And he says, when you understand these things, when you have this confidence in God, when you are fully established in the fact that God is in control of all things, that's really the bottom line of everything here, then he says, you'll walk safely and your foot will not stumble. That's Paul the Apostle could say these words, that everything that happens works together for good. Nothing is happening by happenstance in my life or in your life. If you turn the corner and something happens that's unpleasant, you have to understand one thing first, that God has allowed it. And when he allows anything to come your way, he allows it for a specific reason. Don't be afraid, he says. Well, first of all, he says, when you lie down, you'll not be afraid. And when you, uh, your sleep shall be sweet. Praise God. If you and I believe that God is in control of everything, then we don't have to be sent into sudden fear by the news of the day or the hour or the moment or whatever is going on around us. If we fully believe that God is in complete control, he says, don't be afraid of sudden fear that only the desolation of the wicked when it comes. The Lord will be your confidence and keep your foot from being taken. Now it gets interesting because in verse 27, he says, withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it's in the power of your hand to do it. Now God, they're in the storm, it, it's quite often the human tendency to withdraw our hand from doing good and to begin to cry out about ourselves. A whole focus turns inward. That's, that's just part of the human condition. The only one that can change that is God. The only one that can alter that frailty of our humanity is the Holy Spirit living and working within us every day confirming to our hearts that God is in absolute control of everything. The moment I gave my life to him, I was sealed in the hand of God the Father, according to Jesus Christ, and no man can take me out of that hand. I am as secure as secure can be. I am already at the right hand of God in Christ Jesus. I already have a mansion with my name on the door in eternity. There's already a plan in the mind of God for my life beyond this earth, and beyond whatever I have to go through on this side of eternity. There's a plan for my life and for yours beyond here. This is just a vapor, James said. It's here just for a moment, and it vanishes away. I was saying to Sister Catherine Logan this morning from the Mount Zion School of Ministry, it's almost 15 years ago that Pastor David called me on his birthday and asked if I would come and speak at Times Square Church. 15 years ago, very, very shortly, just a few weeks from now. It's an amazing thing when you begin to think of it, how fast that has gone. How, how it's, it's like a snap of the fingers. Yes, it's not been easy. There have been blessed times. There have been times of deep and personal trial. But it goes so fast, folks. And as quickly as these things go by us, one day it will all be over for you and I. One day we'll meet again at the throne of God. And we will say to each other, wasn't it worth it? Wasn't it great that we didn't let go of faith? Wasn't it incredible that we didn't cast away our confidence in the time of trial? We had a confidence in God and we chose to retain that confidence no matter how difficult things got. Now put a marker please in Proverbs 3 and go to Mark in the New Testament chapter 4. I want to take a look at a journey the disciples took and talk about it in the context of where you and I quite often have to go in this life. Now in Mark chapter 4 and in verse 35... It says, the same day when the evening was come, he said to them, let's pass over to the other side. Now, it says, when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he, that's Jesus, was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. Remember, your sleep shall be sweet when you trust in God. And they woke him up and said, Master, carest not? Thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? 
How is it that you have no faith? Now, they started their journey with a, with a word from God that should have sustained them. He said, let's go to the other side. Now, when God says it, that should be good enough. When God says, I'm going to keep you, shouldn't that be good enough? When he says, I'm going to feed you, when he says, I'm going to look after you, when he, when he says, I'm going to bring home your sons and daughters from afar, shouldn't that be enough? Shouldn't that be all? That, that should be all of the Bible that you and I need. One line from God. Let's go to the other side. You'd think that's good enough. These, these guys had just come from miracle after miracle after miracle. They, they knew the power of God. They knew the faithfulness of his speech. After all the time they'd been with him, not one of them could point to a single incident when he had spoken something that didn't happen or made a promise he didn't keep or called somebody out of a grave who didn't come out. There's, or blessed food and it didn't multiply. Not one could point. Now he says to them, let's go to the other side. That, that should be good enough. And the scripture tells us in verse 36, there were with them other little ships. Now, there are these disciples, they have Jesus in the back of the boat, and obviously he's on a pillow or a cushion of some kind. And there are other little boats, they're all trying to get to the other side too as well. There's a single mom and her kids. I mean, I'm taking license, obviously, with the scripture, but there's some other person over here. There's some group over there. There's another family group here. You can see all these little boats trying to get to the other side. And then all of a sudden, a storm arises. Now, no doubt, many are crying out to God or their concept of God for mercy. Yet the disciples are the only ones in the storm who visibly see God and know, in fact, that he is with them. They see him. I don't know about you, but I see him. All you have to do is get a picture of yourself five, six, ten years ago, if you're a new believer in Christ, look at that thing and then look in the mirror and tell me you don't see God. <laughs> tell me that your whole countenance is not different. Your vocabulary is different. God is in you. In the power of the Holy Spirit, he has changed you. Now, the foundation of fear is based on an inner embracing during times of crisis that somehow things have gotten out of God's control. That is the basis of fear. That's the foundation that Satan would love to put every one who professes to know Christ, he'd love to put you on that foundation. That somehow things are out of God's control. The disciples are rowing, we're going to the other side. The boat's starting to fill up with water. They get an inch of water, then two, then 10, then a foot of water. And then it says the boat was almost full. And they look back and there's Jesus asleep on a pillow in the back of the boat. Amazing when you begin to see it. And they finally, they get, they, they get the impression in their crisis that he's some, God is asleep, God is unaware, God is unconcerned. Have you ever had to battle with that? Somehow he's off in the cosmos just doing some other work and doesn't see your situation, is not aware of the storm you're in, and somehow is not going to do anything. And so finally, when they couldn't contain it anymore, they wake him up and they said, Master, do you not care that we perish? We perish. Now they have God with them in the boat. You'd think that they would be saying, Master, wake up. There are people out there in little boats and they're perishing. Now we have you with us and we have your word and that's good enough, but there are people trying to get to the other side all around and they're, they don't have you with them. You've got to do something. You see, that should be the basis. We're going to be inquiring in the storm. It's not so much for our own safety's sake because we already have him with us. We already have his word. There comes a point where you and I simply have to believe that. We've got to be established in that. We, we've got to trust he's going to take us to the other side. We've got, the other side is heaven, folks. I trust that. We're, we're going to get there. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get to the other side. Praise be to God. But there's a lot of people trying to make it through the storm that we find ourselves in, even at this moment in history, and they don't have God with them. They're rowing for all they're worth, and they're crying out to some form of God as they see him, but they don't understand many who Christ is the way we do, and they don't really understand what he can do for them. Now, faith is rarely evidenced in, in fair weather. I'm, I'm going to say that again. Faith is rarely evidenced in fair weather. Faith is only really faith when it's all you've got left is faith. That's when it really is faith. Now, faith can be a learned concept. Verse 35, Jesus said, let us pass over. I can see the disciples. Should, could anything be any better? God is with us. We're all going to the other side. The, 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 the weather is smooth. We've got these promises. 
Matthew chapter 16 and verse 15, Jesus asked a question to his disciples. He said, who do you say that I am? And in verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. See, Peter was attending Friday night school of the Bible. And he got, he's the guy in the back. I know, I know the answer. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Right answer. You see, Peter was seeing miracles. He's beginning to experience revelation from God. He's, he's, he's in the midst of the supernatural, and he's got all the right answers. But you see, his faith has not yet been tested in the storm. And folks, let me tell you very clearly, we're going into a storm the likes of with, which you and I have never seen in our lifetime. We're, we're heading out, but we're, gonna, we're going through and into a terrible storm. It, it is something that is, is deeper. It is more foreboding than anything that we have ever experienced or possibly ever will experience in this lifetime. You see, but hardship came. When Gethsemane came, Peter again had to have given in to the fear that somehow things had gotten out of the control of even the Son of God. And that's the basis of fear. Peter thought he had it all figured out. He, he had somewhat of a history with God. He had, he had knowledge of the scriptures that he'd memorized. But when things looked like they were getting out of control, it was an issue of trust in his heart. Folks, that's really the basis of it. It's an issue of trust. God's saying to his people today, do you trust me? Do you trust that I can take you through the storm? Do you trust that I will feed you supernaturally? Do you trust that I've never lost control of this situation? I've not lost control of your future. Or I know your needs even before you open your mouth and begin to ask me about it. In John chapter 21, after Christ rose from the dead, he met the disciples and Peter on the seashore. And he said, Peter, do you love me? Now, in order to love someone, you have to trust them. How do you love somebody you don't trust? I don't think, I don't think that's possible. You have to trust. Or you, you can like somebody, or you can marginally like them, or sort of like them. But you don't really love somebody, I don't think, until you really trust them. And, and, until you really know that what that person says is what they're going to do. That, that that person that you love and that loves you would lay their life down for you if necessary. That they would, if you called, they would be there. If you, if you had a burden on your heart, they would want to share it. it. You can't love somebody you don't trust. And I think in measure that's what Jesus is trying to get at in Peter. When, because Peter had taken all the disciples and gone fishing again. Even though that he had seen the miracles and he knew the power of God... Jesus calls them to the shore and addresses Peter specifically because he's going to be used of God to bring many people into freedom in the future. Do you love me, Peter? Now, it's, it's, on, a, it's on a multiplicity of levels that he's speaking to Peter on, but I'm, I'm dealing just specifically with the level of trust today. He says, Peter, this is who I am. Look at me, Peter. I am completely given for you. Now, he couldn't be any more given for him. Peter knew the story. He, he had seen him taken captive in Gethsemane. He had watched him crucified, at least from a distance on Calvary. He had, he had seen the empty tomb. He had been in that upper room when Jesus walked into the room and said, peace to you, and showed them his hands and showed them his side and began to give them courage and instruction. And Jesus said to Peter, he said, do you love me? Do you believe that I will strengthen you in your times of failure? Remember, he came into the room. Now, Peter would have felt like such a failure after all his bragging and all his boasting and how he's going to live for God and how faithful he's going to be, only to deny, you know, the story with an oath that he ever knew the man. <clears throat> and see Jesus coming into the room to Peter. And the first thing he does is show him his hands. I love that concept. It's like, Peter, I've, 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 I'm still going to strengthen you. I see all of your weakness. I know all of your failure. I know all of your frailty. I know your promises are worthless. And I know your boasting is going to lead you nowhere. But in the deepest hour of your trial, when you feel like you've failed to the, and fallen to the bottom, in faith-wise, he said, I'm still going to come to you. And I'm going to show you that I paid the price for your frailty. And I'm going to reach out, Peter, and I'm going to strengthen you. And I'm going to give you. So folks, if, if you find that you struggle in this hour, if you find that you struggle in the days ahead, remember that Jesus will still come to you every night when you lock that room and you're, 
if you even have a bedroom left, if you lock that door and you're there, he's, he's just going to walk in and say peace to you. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be afraid. I'm going to carry you. Don't be afraid, little flock. It is your, it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I'm going to give you resources, inner resources that don't come from anything that you see around you. Jesus was saying to Peter, I'll provide for your physical needs. Right in front of him was, according to John 21, verse 9, there's fish and bread on a fire. I'll provide for you. Now, folks, you and I either believe that or we don't believe that. There's, there's going to come a time when we're going to have to believe it now. The Lord's going to provide. Do we, do we know where it's going to come from? No. Do we have to know? No. The Lord is going to provide. David said, I've been young and I've been old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. Praise God. I don't know how. I just don't know how, but I don't have to know how. I know who has made the promise to me and to you. And he said, I'll show you things to come. And I'll promise to be with you through it all. In John 21 and verse 18, he said to Peter, when you were young, you, you kind of dressed yourself and you went where you want to go. You did what you wanted to do. In other words, you were self-willed and your focus was on yourself. And you kind of governed your own life as you walked through this world. He said, but as you're getting older, he said, you're going to stretch out your hands and you're going to be led into places that you neither want to go or you can go in your own strength. But he's asking Peter a question. Peter, will you keep reaching out even in your times of trial? Will you understand that I will empower you to be a blessing and a strength to others even when you yourself are journeying through the same storm? Peter, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. But if you'll keep your hand stretched out, the power is already there in your hand to do good. Because we have been redeemed from a fallen nature. We have been given the spirit of the living God. The same God who created the universe now lives inside of us as his church. If we will retain this wisdom, if we will walk with this understanding, we'll not be driven by fear to withdraw our hands into a life of self-preservation. But in the midst of the storm, we will stretch out our hands to a needy world, a needy people, a needy society all around us. Believing that God will give us the power to keep giving. It's in the power of our hands to do good. Not will be in our hands. It is in our hands. It is the only thing that stops us from doing good. The only thing that will stop us from being everything we should be in the storm is fear. A lack of trust in God himself and the promises of God being manifested through us. Peter the apostle. Let me, <clears throat> let me just go there for time's sake very quickly myself. Peter the Apostle in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. Now, Peter writes these words around A.D. 62, 63. About two years, maybe a year and a half or so before an incredible bloodbath of persecution that was going to come to the then church through the emperor Nero. And Peter knew it. Now, he would have the, he could have withdrawn himself. He could have fled like was his habitual pattern in, in the natural without the spirit of God. Or he could have stretched out his hands. And by God's grace, he did. By God's grace, he didn't turn back. And folks, I implore you in Christ's name, no matter how dark the days get ahead of us, don't turn back from doing good. Don't turn back from being the answer that God has given to this and every other generation of how provision is found, of how security is found, of where eternal life is found, of where the keys really are to everything that every person in this world is looking for. Peter wrote these words to a church that was just about to suffer and he was going to suffer with it. He says in verse 5 of 1 Peter chapter 1, he said, We are kept by the power of God through faith to unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time wherein you greatly rejoice though now for a season if need be you are in heaviness through manifold temptations that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes though it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ whom having not seen verse 8 you love Peter's speaking now from his own heart. I know these are inspired words of the Holy Spirit, but this was a practical reality now in his own life. I don't see him 
Peter says, ahead of me, but I love him. Amen. I love him, Peter's saying. And see, that's, that's really the, the way through. In whom, he says, though you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Peter walked through this trial a few years later after Nero's persecution began. He wrote the book of 2 Peter, again, giving comfort and consolation to those who are about to suffer. He himself knowing that the, his own martyrdom was just a matter of days and weeks ahead of him. Peter knew this and he experienced and thank God he didn't withdraw his hand. You and I wouldn't have these epistles had he withdrawn his hand and been more focused on his own safety than on helping others who needed to have encouragement get through the storm. Even Jonah knew that living to preserve himself alone was not what those traveling with him in the storm needed. Jonah, you know the story, he took a trip on a ship going in the wrong direction from where God was calling him and an incredible storm came. Everybody starts crying out to their concept of God and they finally asked him, what do we have to do? Jonah knew, he said, I've got to be given for you to get you through the storm. And folks, that's what the church is about. That's what my life is about. That's what your life is about. He said, I've, I've got to take the plunge as it is. Now, technically, he says, you've got to throw me overboard. That's the only way the storm is going to stop. And when Jonah took the plunge, the storm stopped and says, the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. And amazingly, Jonah must have thought it's all over. If, if I give myself to save these people on the ship, it's all over for me. I'm going to die, only to find out that God is in absolute control of everything. God had sent a whale from who knows where to right underneath that ship to swallow him before he had time to even drown. And he was three days and three nights in the belly of that whale. You talk about a prayer meeting. You read it in the book of Jonah. That's the first time you see this guy really praying. He's now wide awake. And he's come to the knowledge that God is in control of everything. Oh, folks, he's in control. He's in control of today. He's in control of tomorrow. He's in control of your life. We have all these stories in the scripture to prove these things to us. That's why the writer of Proverbs says in chapter 3, verse 27, he said, Withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it's in the power of your hand to do it. Now go to Acts chapter 3, please. We're, gonna get, we're getting close to closing here. Acts, Acts chapter 3, verses 7 to 9. Now Peter and John are going up in the temple to pray. It's not a popular time for the gospel, folks. The religious order of the day is still stirred up still somehow feeling like they have the upper hand against the testimony of Jesus Christ. Still very, very intolerant to the actual work of God happening in their midst. And Peter and John went up into the temple to pray. And in verse seven, they, uh, it tells us they, they saw a man, verse two, it says, laying from his mother's womb, daily laid at the gate, and he's begging those who are entering into the temple for money. And in verse 7, it says, he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Now, just think about for a moment, how much easier it would be just to go into the temple and pray without drawing attention to yourself. Because, folks, this was not an easy time. This was a difficult time. Especially if you want to go in incognito and you want to just go in and say, well, I'm just going to go in and pray. I'm going to lift up my hands. I'm going to pray. But remember, the scripture says, when it's in the power of your hand to do good, don't withhold from them to whom it is due. Don't say to your neighbor, I'll come back tomorrow, or you come back tomorrow, I'll help you tomorrow. You see, the scripture says, when it's in the power of your hand to do it today. And, and Peter and James, or, or John rather, are, are walking in, and there's a lame beg. Now they know what's going to happen. If they reach out to this man, and the scripture says they reach out to this man, Peter grabs him by the right hand and lifts him up on his feet. They walk into the temple, and this guy is dancing and leaping and praising God. Talk about going into conflict knowing 
You have to know God's in control of everything. You have to have that inner assurance because they are heading willfully into the storm. They know exactly what's going to happen. You can't keep this guy quiet and the religious order of the day does not appreciate a lame man being healed, especially when it doesn't happen their way and the way they think it, it didn't ever happen their way and they don't think it should be happening. And it says he leaping up stood and walked and entered went into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. So what is the outcome of this? In chapter 4, verse 3, the temple authorities says they laid their hands on them and put them in hold to the next day. So off to prison they went. They knew exactly what is going to happen. Verse 21, so when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for which that which was done. In other words, they threatened them. You will suffer and you will perish if you pursue this path. Now, folks, I know what this is about. Years ago, when I was a, in a secular occupation, I, I don't want to say too much about it, but I remember my superior walking in one day in, with all the guys I'm working with in the police department, points his finger right in my face and says, you're finished. We're going to get you in front of everybody in the room. We're going to get you. They were just so tired of me sharing about Christ. So tired of me standing up for God. So tired of me. I was a very vocal Christian. I was not obnoxious. I was just very vocal. I couldn't help it. It was just in me. I remember one guy I worked with. He said, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Do you ever talk about anything else but Jesus? And I said, well, there's nothing else I want to talk about. There's nothing else that's occupying my mind. There's nothing else that I have in my thoughts. And so I'm, I'm now in a situation where I've got a finger of somebody in high authority pointing at me saying, we're gonna get you and doing it publicly. We're gonna get you. You're finished, he told me, your history. And, and so it would be so easy to just draw back, stay quiet for a little while. Why should I go into this storm ahead of me? And, but to make a long story short, in the next week or two, I led two of those guys in that room to Christ and they got filled with the Holy Ghost. And they, they started running around the police department Passing out tracts, <laughs> even to the guys that were threatening me. They walked in and I knew there was just like the lame man walking and dancing and leaving. I knew that I'm in big, big trouble here now. But you, you had to look and say, God is worth it. And I do believe everything is in your hand. I do believe you have everything under control. I gave you my life. And if, if these guys are allowed to somehow lock me up for a season or do whatever they want to do, then you've allowed it for a purpose. There has to be, that trust has to come into the heart. That all things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. Not some things, not a few things, not most things. All things work together for good. All things. All things. When you're popular in the workplace and when you're unpopular. When you're having a good day, when you're having a bad day, when people love you, when they hate you. All things work together for good to those that love God and are the called according to his purpose. So what did they do? Being let go in verse 23. Now before I read that, I want to go back just for a moment. Remember, he says, the Lord by wisdom, Proverbs 3.19, has founded the earth and by understanding he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down the dew. My son, don't let these things depart from your eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. Then you will walk in your way safely. Your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you'll not be afraid. Yea, you will lie down and your sleep shall be sweet. Don't be afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being taken. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it's in the power of your hand to do it. Say not to thy neighbor, go and come again, and tomorrow I will give you when you have it by thee. And it says in Acts chapter 4 and verse 23, how, how do they respond to this threatening? How do they respond to this imprisonment? In verse 23 it says, in being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God, which made heaven and the earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of your servant David said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? 
You see, they had a basis of their prayer. They said, God, you made everything. You keep everything in divine order. You're in absolute control of everything. Everything exists exactly the way you have allowed it to until the day you fold up the earth and the heavens as a scroll and remake earth and heaven in the way that it was supposed to be made in the first place. Why do the heathen rage? Why do the people imagine that they can stand against the testimony of Christ? Why does Satan himself imagine that he can implant fear in the hearts of God's people and somehow stop the testimony of Christ from going forward? The kings of the earth stood up, verse 26, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. It seemed, must have seemed to them like the whole world was gathered together against this testimony. In verse 28 they said, For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. In other words, they're all gathering together, but they can only do what you have for spoken that they can do. They can't go beyond the borders. All they can do is what you've allowed them to do. They can't be any more fierce than you've allowed them to be. They can't do any more than you will allow them to do. And now, Lord, he says, behold their threatenings and grant to thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. Stretch forth your hand, they said, through us. It's not an invisible hand in a sense, but it's, a, it's, a, it's the hand of God stretched forth through the hand of his church. Stretch forth your hand to heal. They had just lifted up this lame man and because of their hand touching his and he receiving strength through faith in Christ, they had gone to jail and now they were threatened. And because of these threatenings, they said, oh God, here's how you should respond. Stretch forth your hand and heal more. Stretch forth your hand, give us more power. Stretch forth your hand, O God, and let signs and wonders be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. God Almighty, stretch forth your hand and let signs and wonders be done in our generation. Let impossible become possible. Help us, God, to lift up the weak. Help us to point direction to the confused. Help us to hug and encourage the weary. Help us, God Almighty, to point to Calvary's cross in this generation without fear, without trepidation. Help us, God, to point to the promises in this book whereby everyone can have confidence in the time of shaking. And the scripture says, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They're all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. When they prayed, the place was shaken. When they prayed, today, if you come to this altar and you pray, God, stretch forth your hand through my hands. Through me, God, as an individual, through us collectively as a church, stretch out your hands to a perishing, fearful society in a time of incredible storm. Stretch out your hands, oh God, when it's not popular. Stretch out your hands through us. And when they prayed, the place was shaken. Remember Paul and Silas, it says at midnight they sang and the whole prison compound was shaken and all the doors were opened. And I'll tell you today, in Christ's name, when you are willing to be given for other people, when you are willing to walk in God's way, there's not a prison door can hold you. There's a shaking will come and unlock those prison doors. There are people today at this altar and in these aisles, you're gonna be set free from lifelong bondages. You're just gonna walk out by the power of God. I know this in my heart. I know this. I know this. For the church has to be free in this last hour of time. You've gotta be free. I've gotta be free. All fear's gotta go. Perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. I'm not ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. Praise God. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Praise God. Bless the Lord. And at Calvary, a victory was won over every besetting sin, every struggle of your flesh, every power of captivity was destroyed at Calvary. If you have in your heart to be a vessel of God, you can stand up, you can move forward, you can begin to praise God, and you will be set free by the power of God. <laughs> praise God. When they began to pray, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. 
That's the power of God. That's the third person of God. That is God come down to a church. Folks, you don't need to be filled with religion. You don't need any more knowledge. You need to be filled with God. You need the Spirit of God to come upon you. If you've not been filled with the Holy Ghost, you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. You need to know that you are God gripped. You need to know that the power of God has come upon this earth and vessel and that you're not now walking in the strength of your own reasoning, the strength of your own power and might. But now the hand of God is in you and upon you, stretching out through you, speaking into your mind, giving steel to your backbone, giving strength to your eyes, giving something into your speech, giving something in your step, that in the midst of the storm, you're not cowering like those around you. You are filled with the love of God, the compassion of God, and the power of God for a perishing generation. And for those who are already filled with the Holy Ghost, there's a time in every life, and I've been praying this in my own life lately, there's a time you need to be shaken again, and again, and again. God, don't let me settle in somewhere. Keep me moving forward. Keep my life going forward. God, don't let me settle in to a past legacy of success or whatever has come my way. God, don't let me settle in. There's so much more to do. There's so much more that can be accomplished. Stretch forth your hand, oh God. Stretch forth your hand and begin to heal multitudes of people. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. And they began to speak the word of God with boldness. That means confidence came into the heart. That means things they had learned, but maybe had learned some of these things with a, a measure of trepidation as to whether or not it's really true. Does it really apply to me? Suddenly, when the Holy Spirit came, that issue was settled in the heart. And they began to speak God's promises with boldness. They believed them. They knew they could have confidence in God. And oh, God, help us in this generation. Help us, God, to hear these words. Help us, Holy Spirit. Help us, God Almighty. Lord, consider the threatenings, Lord, against this whole world now. Consider, God, where we are living. And oh, Lord, we ask you, God, that you would stretch forth your hand from within your church, your body of believers, oh God, and that you would do great signs and wonders in our generation. God Almighty, put it in our hands to feed this generation. Put it in our hands to give encouragement. Put it in our hands, oh God, to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Give us authority to cast out powers of darkness. Put the word of God in our hands and in our mouths that we will speak God's word without compromise and without fear. God Almighty, have a church in this last hour of time. Father, we thank you for this. We praise you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. 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 For those who need to get out of prison, this would be the morning to do it. For those who need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, come. For those who need to be shaken by the power of God, you come. Just make your way to this altar as we stand in the annex. You can stand between the screens. And we're going to worship. And you lay hold of God while we worship. Let's all stand here in the sanctuary. Make your way here, please. You lay hold of God today. Lay hold of God. Come with faith. Don't worship your fear. Come with faith in your heart. Everyone who's got besetting sin and you've got to get out of this. You've got life patterns you can't break. You need to be down here. You need to trust God today. You're going to walk away if you want to be a vessel of God. You're going to walk away from these life controlling things, issues in your mind and in your body. And for those who are not filled with the Holy Ghost, come down here and let God touch you. Let the Holy Spirit touch you as we worship. You believe that God will fill you. You've got to believe. Why would he die on a cross and then withhold from you? What would be the purpose of that? How strange that would be. You've got to believe like you believe for your salvation. And as you do, if you feel the Holy Spirit coming upon you to speak in other tongues, then speak in other tongues. Then just begin to unashamedly speak in other languages. That's just the initial sign that you're filled with the Holy Ghost. But let God do that. Folks, it's not time to play games anymore. It's not time to be casual with God. It's not time. You don't have time to do this. 
You don't have time to consider it and say, well, maybe next week or the week after. You don't have time. You've got to do this now, folks. You've got to trust me on this this morning. You don't have time. You've got to get this faith of God in your heart now. You've got to come to him now. You've got to cry out to him now. You've got to say, God, embolden me, embolden me, embolden me, Lord. Embolden me by the power of the Holy Ghost. Stretch your hands through me, Lord. Help me, God, to do good while good can be done. Help me not to withhold your good, Lord, and contain it in this earthen vessel. Help me to be a channel of your blessing in my generation. Now lift your voices, everyone here. Lift your voice to God as a church. As a church has to be filled with the Holy Ghost. You have to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Ask Him. Just ask Him, folks. I don't care what denomination you come from. Just ask Him. You need the power of God in your life. Ask Him to come and touch you. Ask Him to fill you. Ask Him to empower you. Ask Him and He will. Praise God. We're going to worship. You keep crying out to God as we worship. Lift up your hands to the Lord, if you will. Father, I come against every weapon of the devil, every prison door, every place of captivity and fear. I take absolute authority over these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I thank you that you said that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there would be freedom. There would be captivity, would be have to let its hold go. I thank you, Lord, that today there are gathered in this house of free people. Lord, we are free because of Christ. We are free because of Calvary. We are free from the grip of sin. We are free from the penalty of sin. We are a free people. Now, God, let your healing now begin to flow. Lord, we believe you. Say that with me. I believe you, Jesus, that you will look after me. I need not be afraid. As you are keeping the heavens and reserving them for a certain day, so you will keep me and reserve me for your purposes and your purposes alone. I am not afraid. God, you've not given me a spirit of fear, but you've given me power and love and a sound mind. God, thank you for your testimony is alive in me. And my hands will continue to reach out to people all around me in their time of need. I will not withhold. I will not say come back. I have all I need because you live inside of me. And God, I'm so thankful. Tonight, my sleep is going to be sweet in Jesus name hallelujah hallelujah